As Thea said, my name is Devana Bell. I am the Deputy Director at NCAT, and NCAT runs the ATRA program, and we are the co-hosts of the ATRA SARE conference here. I hope everybody has had a chance to visit our booth, but if you haven't, we have some amazing publications on different agricultural challenges um, across all different areas of ag. So I'm here to talk to you about the environmental benefits of lo local food systems. Um, so when I was thinking about the topic, I figured let's break it down. And I only have a few slides that are text heavy. The rest of them are really photos. But you know, it begs the question of, well, OK, so what are the agricultural environmental impacts that we're looking at and thinking about? And here I've just listed some of them, but there are the main ones. Pollution from heavy use of agricultural inputs. Ag inputs are fertilizers, <coughs> pesticides, herbicides. And what they do is they cause um, decreased so soil fertility, which then requires additional fertilization. It uh, causes water pollution, which, I mean, I'm sure everybody here has heard about fish kills and eutrophication, dead zones, the Gulf is the worst one we can all think of, polluted drinking water. All of these have very high costs to <coughs> communities and, and the society. Uh, we see a big reduction of pollinators caused by utilizing pesticides and high levels of chemicals, lost biodiversity, soil loss from major soil erosion. Um, CAFO, which I think everybody here probably knows, is confined animal factory operations. The waste from those animals causes major pollution into air, water, and land, uh, really impacting the communities around them, as well as waterways downstream, very far downstream at times. Uh, antibiotic overuse leads to antibiotic resistance. That's a little bit outside of the environmental impacts, but there are going to be some things in this presentation that are. I just couldn't resist. And then the next question to me it begs, what is local food? <clears throat> Lots of different communities have very different definitions of local food. But if we just take it extremely literally, what local food is, is food produced relatively close to where it's sold. And I particularly think that there shouldn't be one set definition. If you look at uh, Rhode Island compared to Montana, you don't want to have um, a rule that it can only be state local food only equals food from that state, because Rhode Island is a very small state, and they likely are and should be uh, purchasing from neighboring states, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and others. If you look at a large state like Montana, maybe that's more possible, but still not desirable depending upon where you are in the state. Local food could actually be from Canada in the upper parts of Montana, northern Montana. So local food also is not a reliable indicator of sustainability. Local food doesn't tell you whether, how it was produced and uh, whether they were using environmentally friendly practices. And interestingly, nor are food miles. Food miles are not really a good indicator of environmental sustainability. And the reason for that is because transportation is not equal when you're talking about trucking or, for example, via train or ocean barge. There's, a, if you're trucking, it has a much lar larger carbon footprint than shipping via train. So it's interesting to me because that's really what kicked off our local food movement was food miles. And it was often predicated on food miles being the most important. When actually, I think I saw a, an estimate of 85%, 83 to 85% of the carbon footprint of agriculture is dependent upon the production method, not on the food miles. Okay, so my argument here and what I maintain is that local food is actually the good food system. It's what people think of as the good food system, is that consumers are wanting local food because they want, to, they want it for various reasons, actually, and included in that are the, what I wrote up on the slide. So they want to know 
They want transparency in that food chain. They want to know what farm it came from. So I maintain that local food and good food is part of the good food system, which is source identified. It's farm identified. You know where that product is coming from. Consumers want fresh and delicious food. I believe that consumers are looking for a healthier, more ethical, environmentally and socially responsible product when they're shopping for local food. They want to support their local farms, and they want to keep those uh, farming landscapes. They are looking for, oftentimes, pasture-raised animals for eggs and meats. Oftentimes, they're looking for more sustainable and organic, or even regenerative and beyond organic. I wasn't loving the statistics being pulled for local food coming from 2015 because it's a market that's growing very rapidly. And at the same time, I recognize that's what's available. So I saw, um, I saw an, a statistic of that local food is estimated to be 20 billion in 2019. I'm not sure that we're going to hit it, but I think it's more accurate than saying local food is about $8 billion because that was a 2015 number and we're now in 2018 and it grows at double digits each year. Okay, so going along with my maintaining that local food is a food that is more environmentally responsible. Um, here I'm showing you a picture of American guinea hogs. These are, far, these are pigs that are from my farm in Virginia, actually. And um, they're grazers. They're half the size of large breed pigs. And these are animals that live outside but also have access to the indoors, an uh, indoor pig house, um, if they want it or need it. They can go in, they can go out. So you can see a pasture-raised animal is more environmentally and ethically responsible. It's an animal that's eating and living in natural settings. Um, their waste fertilizes the land versus polluting. And in fact, in this picture, you can't tell very well, but this is, um, I had them in my blueberry bushes because I have about 40 some, 45 very large old blueberry bushes that had really bad poison ivy problems. And I asked and asked for years about what I could do about the poison ivy issues. And it just so happened that I put the pigs in there because it was uh, getting overgrown with grass as well. And it was a good place for them to graze. And they ate and ripped up all the poison ivy. It was just this great benefit that I didn't even think of. Um, and so their meat nourished my family and other families in the community. So I get that this is a more expensive meat, but the point I want to make is that it comes with low to no externalities and yields, I believe, a healthier product. In this case, with American guinea hogs, they actually have higher omega-3 um, fatty acids versus uh, a confined animal. Okay, so the polar opposite, which I went through, um, you know, the photos available online, and I tried to pull ones that were not really hor horrific to look at, um, even though this still is a bit horrific, but are the big CAFOs. Now, the CAFOs come with uh, lagoons for their waste. <coughs> And the, their waste is actually polluting versus fertilizing. It's polluting the air, it's polluting the water, and it's polluting the land, and it's polluting the communities that live right next to it. It's reducing the value of the land in the communities nearby. I worked in North, and lived in North Carolina for a while, and, and it's extremely challenging for people that live in, um, in communities right near CAFOs. They, the stench, I've heard um, a, a family telling me the stench is just horrendous. Um, you know, I have to say that's certainly not my definition of ethical, and that the cheap meat that these produce come with very high externalities. Those externalities are pollution and toxicity of chemicals used in producing the grains that they're fed. 
Now, of course, uh, local doesn't mean that it's non-GMO necessarily or organic, but where it is, they're not using subsidized grain. And the subsidized grain is a low-cost commodity that creates a cheap meat that is available with very high externalities costs to society. A little happier picture. This is a farm in Montana, uh, Jenny Sabo's farm. She's got 500 acres that she has her cattle running on. She also has a pretty diversified system. She also has American guinea hogs, actually, and uh, she has chickens as well. And so this is a great example of sustainable grazing. Sustainable grazing and pastures increases soil health, and it cycles the nutrients. It builds the soil organic matter and soil function and it decreases soil erosion and nutrient loss into streams. In my opinion, this is a very, very ethical product. These, I buy my, my a beef from her, and, uh, and it's delicious, and there's lot, there are lots of studies that show that grass-fed and grass-finished beef are higher in vitamin B12, which is you know nature's Prozac for people. Um, B12, the B vitamins are really important for brain function. And there are two to five times more omega-3s in grass-fed beef than in grain-fed. More antioxidants, vitamins, and minerals. So here we have a great example of a sustainable way to raise chickens versus the next picture. Um, here you see, these are likely meat birds up top to the left, and down below are likely egg layers. I'm sure it is. I can see in the chicken house that they've got the boxes. And so what they're doing here is, is they're pulling the, they're called chicken tractors. They're pulling them across the fields. Their waste is fertilizing the pastures. You can do this on top of cover crops. Uh, you can do it on fallow fields as you're leaving your fields for rotation. It's a great way to give fertilization to the land and not pollute. Um, and then, it's, it, basically, it's the same concept with the, with the egg layers. They live more naturally. Uh, again, I maintain that this has very little to no negative externalities, and it's a healthier product. And I say it's a healthier product because these animals are living in a natural setting where they're getting to eat bugs, insects, pests, and I would say it's highly likely in their feed that they are not getting antibiotics and real Prozac and caffeine and a multitude of other um, ingredients in animal feed that goes into CAFOD uh, large-scale chicken operations. And the alternative, or one alternative, is the large-scale confined operations where you've got the animals eating feeds filled with um, ingredients that I mentioned prior before. Uh, there's a lot of, of waste that's coming out of these large factories. And again, it's polluting the waterways, it's polluting the land and the air, it's um, it's not good for the chickens, frankly. There's a high death rate, and it's really not good for the farmers also um, dealing with them. Uh, so here we have diversified cropping. Um, up to the left, the top left, you can see a diversified cropping system that is utilizing integrative pest management, uh, increasing biodiversity, and providing habitat for pollinators. And again, I'm showing you extremes here. So then the, the lower right corner, I'm making some assumptions. That is a photo of a monoculture that's high use of chemical inputs. This is typical with monocultures. So high use of fertilizers, high use of herbicides, uh, possibly high use of pesticides. Uh, could be GMO where they're utilizing uh, round up heavily. There's a lack of biodiversity and a lack of habitat for pollinators. 
This is a good picture of integrated pest management. Um, I hope you guys can see. You can see the ladybugs eating the aphids. I felt like it was a lot better indicator um, than the other pictures because you can see it, see it in action. So integrated pest management utilizes natural predators, insect predators, to deal with pest problems versus chemicals. Um, you know, I was afraid you probably wouldn't be able to see it, but one of the sunflowers to the right here has uh, a bee on it, and so I just wanted to show that farms that have diversification, that provide um, a habitat for pollinators, are really giving an environmental benefit and an environmental service, an ecosystem service. Most folks here, or many folks here, probably know and understand that pollinators are super critical for our food system. About 30% of our um, food and fiber comes from the ability of pollinators to pollinate them and help them reproduce. So without pollinators, we would be in big trouble. This is an example of uh, soil conservation on the top versus soil erosion. So the top right picture, it's a little bit blurry, but it shows clover as a cover crop in between wheat. And the bottom one clearly shows land left, uh, bare land that is exposed to the elements. And then when it rains, it washes the topsoils away, which is super bad for the land fertility, but it's also really bad for our waterways. And then I thought this was a really nice photo of um, a good indicator of very rich soil. Soil is the foundation of our agricultural system and the soil ecosystem, the soil biome is critical for having um, fertility and the ability to grow. So uh, this one shows some nice big fat earthworms and, and a dark color of the soil and you can uh, it looks like he has a pretty diversified system there. Uh, local food systems support rural communities, and local food systems also feed urban towns and cities. If you look at the, the contrast there, you can see the housing developments and urban sprawl which the more developed we have our land, the more concrete there usually is, the more runoff there usually is, and pollution that goes into our waterways versus infiltration. So the less development, you have more water infiltration. And so that's another environmental benefit. So just in summary, the good, local good food systems, environmental benefits provided services that they provide are carbon sequestration in soils, increasing soil health and fertility, decreased use of agricultural inputs, decreased pollution, soil and input runoff, eutrophication, dead zones, um, improving water quality and conservation, promoting biodiversity and habitat for native pollinators, and keeping local land in agriculture. Thank you very much.